YouTube, Nablus here with another Wheel of Time video for you all. Now in this video, we're gonna be profiling the nation of Andor from the Wheel of Time. Now as this is the first of this series on my channel, let me explain how we're gonna be structuring these national profiles. I've created 10 sections that we're gonna to use to examine each nation in the Wheel of Time, starting with Andor. The sections are as follows. History, demographics, geography, economy, governmental structure and law, military forces, overall power, notable landmarks, significance to the story, and then what happens after the end of the books. Before we get into the rest of the video, let me pause and say sections one through eight of the video are going to have a spoiler rating of yellow, meaning that there will be mild spoilers that don't touch on the plot, but may give away details that you don't get until later in the novels. Sections nine and 10 will contain major spoilers, and I will give a new spoiler warning before we reach these sections. Without further ado, let's take a look at the nation of Andor from the Wheel of Time. Kicking it off, let's dive into the history of Andor. Andor is one of the oldest nations in the Westlands. Its origins date back to the time of Ardor Hawkwing's empire. Now, Ardor Hawkwing was a ruler of a small kingdom that managed to conquer the entire of the Westlands. I'll do another video on him another time. Basically, the kingdom of Aldashar was conquered by Hawkwing's forces around a thousand years prior to the beginning of the Eye of the World. Ardor Hawkwing left the royal line of Aldashar in power in the area to basically rule as his governors for the province. Indara Castling was the daughter of the last king of Aldashar and she was appointed as Hawkwing's governor. After Hawkwing's death, his empire collapsed and many of the former provinces began to fight for territory and power. Osalane's daughter, Ashara, joined forces with one of Hawkwing's top generals, Soran Maravale, and they carved out the kingdom of Andor. At the time of its founding, Andor consisted of not much more than the capital, Camelon, and a few surrounding villages. Rather than trying to expand the territory quickly, Andor focused on cautious expansion, not trying to take territory until they knew they could hold it. Because of this strategy, Andor never overextended her reach and was able to survive when most of the other nations at the collapse of Hawkwing's empire could not. The recent history of Andor at the start of the Eye of the World, Andor has gone through a change in the ruling family. Tigraine, the daughter of Queen Mordrell and Mantiar, ran away due to the advice of Aes Sedai Gitara Morosa. Her disappearance and the earlier death of her brother Luke caused Queen Mordrell to die of despair, starting a succession war in Andor with Morghese of House Trakan taking the throne, where she rules until the start of the series. The realm of Andor is one of the most populous nations in all of the Westlands, with a population of around 10 million people. Although it's a large nation, there are vast sections of the country that are not very populated. Andorran people are typically fair-skinned, with blue eyes and blonde hair. They are known as a proper people, and the dress of both the men and women in Andor reflect the, this proper attitude. Andorran women typically wear dresses of a square cut that reveal very little. Andorran men typically wear trousers and undershirt and a plain or slightly ornamented coat with cuffs that are turned back and the collar upright. Both men and women wear cloaks when necessary along with their clothing to give them a fully covered look with very little skin showing. Andorans speak a very common modern form of English like the English countryside manner that you'd find in England today with the nobles tending to speak in a very proper tone very similar to the difference between the way a normal English person would speak. Hello, Governor. Hello, mate. And then the royal family in England. First of all, I would like to make one thing quite clear. Yes. I never explain anything. Due to its high population, Andor has some of the most populous cities and towns in the Westlands. Berlon is a medium-sized town in the very west of Andor, near the Mountains of Mist. Berlin is a wooden-walled town, far from the seat of power in Andor, but its importance lies in the mining and refining of the gems and metals that come out of the Mountains of Mist. Whitebridge is a very important town that sits on the River Arenel. It is known for the shimmering white bridge that runs across the river. More on that later. Whitebridge has docks and warehouses at the center of trade, and it's kind of in the middle of the continent there. It's about the same size size as Berlon, however it's a little bit nicer and has better stonework, things like that. Erangil is a medium-sized city at the far east of Andor on the border with Karian. It sits along the river Arran and is a major trade and transportation hub in Andor. But the largest, most important, and most populous city in Andor, as well as one of the most important and largest cities in the world, is Camelon. Camelon is the seat of power for the queen and is widely considered the second most beautiful city in the world behind Tarvala. The city is surrounded by a 50-foot high wall that stretches 24 miles all the way around the new city. There is a separate section of Camelon called the Inner City, which is an older and Ogier built portion of the city that is also walled and contains the Royal Palace. The population of Camelon at the time of the book series is 300,000 people. 
Andor sits directly in the middle of the Westlands and covers more area than any other nation. It is a long rectangular shaped country that borders Kyrian on the east, Merindi in the south, and the Mountains of Mist on the west. There are no other nations bordering Andor to the north. Much of this area is barren and uninhabited. The country is roughly 1,800 miles wide and about 500 miles north to south, with a slightly larger area north to south in the Mountains of Mist. The country is roughly 1 million square miles in area. There are two major river systems that run through Andor that also serve as valuable trading and transportation hubs. The River Arenel dissects the country down the middle, with the main stopping point in Andor being at Whitebridge. The River Arenel originates in Maradon and Saldea and runs into the Menethendrel River once it passes Whitebridge. Whitebridge is the only river crossing of the Arenel after Maradon, making Whitebridge an important river port city. The River Arenin serves as the eastern border of Andor, with the nation of Kyrian across the river. Arengil is the major port city along the Arenin River. The River Arenin starts in the far north mountains and flows through Tarvalin, Arengil, and all the way down through Tyr, making it an important transportation and trade highway. The middle section of Andor between Berlon and Whitebridge is largely devoid of habitation, and there is just not that much population there. The Two Rivers area of Andor is a remote and isolated area with much of the Two Rivers population not even knowing that they are a part of Andor. It's quite isolated due to its geographical features with the mountains in the west, with rivers both bordering the south and then the west. With the only river crossing being Tarn Ferry, it's very difficult to get to. Andor is one of the wealthiest nations in the Westland, primarily due to its natural resources and favorable trading locations. The Andorran economy is based around mining and, and refining of metals like bronze, copper, gold, and then gems from the mountains of mist. They produce much of the world's iron and refined steel. Some of the world's best bell foundries are found in Berlon, Andor's primary mining and refining city. Andor produces large amounts of grain, beef, mutton, linen, woven goods, and leather. They have been one of the primary exporters of grain to Kyrian, and they produce and export many woven goods. The Two Rivers regions also produces and exports tobacco, which is a comparable to modern tobacco. Two Rivers tobacco is known all over the world, with areas as far away as the Aiel Waste knowing of the quality of Two Rivers tobacco. The Andoran government is headed by the queen. There are no kings in Andor and never have been since the founding of the nation. The queen is a hereditary title that draws its legitimacy from close ties to Ashara, the first queen of Andor. The oldest male sibling to the queen is often selected to be the first prince of the sword. The first prince of the sword is trained from childhood to command the queen's armies in times of war and to be her advisor in times of peace. If the queen has no brother, then she would appoint someone else to this title. Andor follows a feudal form of government with a ruling class of aristocracy that would serve as the local lord and magistrates when the need for judgment on small crimes uh, would arise. If there was not a local lord, the queen would appoint local magistrates to administer law. Andorran law applies to both aristocracy as well as commoners, making it more enlightened than many of the other countries in the Westlands that have separate laws that apply to the aristocracy. Titles in Andor pass from the oldest daughter, not from the oldest male heir as in other cultures. Property among the aristocracy is also passed down to the oldest female heir. This is not typically the case with commoners, however, in Andor. Assets would be split equally among remaining family members. Commoners are able to marry lords and ladies. While it's not common, it does happen on occasion in Andor. The military body in Andor is known as the Queen's Guard. Andor does not keep a large standing army in times of peace, but there is typically always a military presence along the southern border with Murundi, as raids are common across the border. There is also a strong garrison at Erangul due to the ongoing conflicts with Kyrian. The Queen's Guard also served as the primary police force for the realm, as well as the city defense of Camelin. It is estimated that the standing army at times of peace was no more than 20,000, but if all the banners were called, it is thought that Andor could field an army of up to 200,000 men, despite many of them being untrained. This would be the largest army a single nation in the Westlands could muster, making Andor one of the strongest military forces in the world. Men that fought in the Andoran military wore a red undercoat with gleaming mail and plate armor, a red cloak, and a conical helmet with a barred face guard. The highest ranking member of the Andoran military was the Captain General of the Guard. Officers in the Andoran military would wear knots on their shoulders to indicate rank. Four knots would indicate Captain General, three knots for Captain, two knots for lieutenant and one knot for under lieutenant. Andoran soldiers would salute with an arm across their chest and the battle cry for Andor is forward the white lion. 
Andor sits as the largest nation, one of the wealthiest, and being the most populous, it's able to fill the largest army. In addition, its favorable location and dearth of natural resources make Andor potentially the most powerful single nation in the Westlands. Thematically in the books, Andor is portrayed very similarly to England in custom and thoughts on propriety. Even in the audiobooks, Andorran nobles are portrayed as having a very proper almost Queen's English type sound. Robert Jordan has said in separate excerpts that he did base a lot of the nation of Andor around the idea of Camelot or English myth. There are a couple notable landmarks and locations in Andor that if you were a visitor to the country that you may want to take a look at. First, let's start with the White Bridge. The building of the White Bridge dates back into the Age of Legends. It's an enormous bridge that straddles the River Arenel. It is made of an unknown but super strong material. The bridge gleams white and arches really high over the river and it kind of dwarfs the town that's next to it. It appears to be too frail to support its massive weight, but it is incredibly strong. It would not even become slippery when it was wet. Shadar Logoth is a massive an ancient abandoned city that dates back to the Trolloc Wars more than 2,000 years ago. The city fell in upon itself during the Trolloc Wars as the people became cruel and merciless as they tried to fight the shadow and eventually their suspicion and hatred caused them to fall in upon themselves. None of the people were left alive. All that is left there now is Mashadar, the great mist that eats the souls of those that enter the city, and Mordeth, who was visor to the last king of Eridhal. He somehow survived the fall and is trapped into the city until he can convince someone to take him out essentially a type of possession. The city sits just north and east of Barillon in the west of Andor and backs up to the river Arenel. It receives no visitors as people know the reputation of folks disappearing when they enter the city. The Tower of Ginjai is a solid metallic tower that rises 200 feet into the air but has no windows or doors. It is just a smooth metal tower. Most people in Andor have no idea what the tower is other than you pass it along the river Arenel on the way to Whitebridge. It's about 10 days north of Whitebridge on the Arenel River. Most river traders use it as a marker, but is secretly a doorway to another world. Before we get into significance of the story and what happens at the end of the novels, I am going to throw up a new spoiler warning as there will be major spoilers coming forward. Uh, the spoiler rating for the last section of this video will be red, meaning there are major spoilers for the plot that you may not want to hear unless you have finished and completed the novels. Andor is greatly significant to the plot and story of the Wheel of Time. There's a lot of time within the novel spent in Andor, and almost all of the main characters are from Andor. Rand, Matt, Perrin, Egwene, Nynaeve, Elaine, and even Galad and Gawain. Many of these characters go on to become rulers in their own right, with Perrin becoming Lord of the Two Rivers, Liege Lord to the Queen of Gildon, and married to the Queen of Saldea. Matt is the Prince of Ravens and married to the ruler of the Shanshan and leader of the armies of light. Rand is obviously, well, Rand. He's the Dragon Reborn. Uh, and Egwene becomes the Amarlin Seat. Galad becomes the head of the Children of the Light. Elaine becomes Queen of Andor and Carian. They all come from Andor. Let's take a look at some of the events that happened in Andor so we can see where this significance comes into play. The Forsaken Ravine essentially took over the country as he used compulsion on Queen Morghais acting as her lover, Lord Gabriel. He was eventually killed by Rand, and Rand took control of the city, but he eventually leaves so that Elaine can take the throne herself. These events spark the succession plotline, and it leaves much of the world in chaos, which was exactly what the plan of the Shadow was. With the most powerful country in the world broken and not unified, it made the last battle further stacked against the forces of light. Andor is also significant in that it's the home of the Black Tower, the seat of the new male Aes Sedai. The Black Tower started as just a farm that Randall Thor was set aside for his amnesty for men who could channel, but it not only grew into the center of their power, but a large walled town with a palace structure being constructed to rival the White Tower. Andor played a major role in the last battle itself. Before the last battle began, Eludra and Matt Cawthon conceived dragons, which are what we would know today as cannons. With the help of Andoran bell founders and with the blessing of Queen Elaine Trakhand, the dragons were built to be used as part of the Andoran military. These would play a prominent role in the last battle and help turn the tide when it appeared the light would lose at the fields of Marilor. Andor, and specifically Camelin, is one of the major theaters of the last battle. The shadow sprung a surprise attack through the ways in Camelin, with Trollocs pouring into the city and burning it to the ground. The Band of the Red Hand, under the command of Lord Talmanes, was able to save the dragons, but the city was lost and completely destroyed. The Trollocs were drawn out of the city eventually, but it was burned to rubble by the end of the final battle. But luckily, many civilians were able to escape, and the Queen and most of the ruling class were at the fields of Marilor at the time, meeting with Rand, so there is continuity of government. 
So what happens after the last battle? Well, let's take a look at the state of Andor at the end of the last battle, and then I'll give you some of my predictions as to what I think happened in the future. Camelon at the end of the battle is completely destroyed, and much of the countryside surrounding it is destroyed as well. Elaine Tricon survives the last battle and gives birth to twins, a product of her and Rand's marriage, so the royal line is intact. The Sun Throne has been taken by Elaine as well, so both countries are not only at peace, but the nobles have land in, in each country, so they are effectively unified at the end of the last battle. The Two Rivers is an independent area with their own laws now, as Elaine granted that to Perrin, but under the Andorran crown. So Andor has essentially grown stronger after the last battle, because previously, although Two Rivers was in Andor, it was not really a part of the country. I believe it's safe to say at the end of the last battle, much of Andor falls into peaceful times, with Caelan being rebuilt, and then there's further stability with the dragon's peace, keeping war from coming back from the surrounding countries. I believe Andor would become very prosperous, with Rand and Elaine's children eventually ascending to power as well, more than likely as channelers themselves. It is not known that they will take over for Elaine as ruler, as she's a very strong Aes Sedai, and therefore will likely live hundreds of years, but it is safe to say that there will be stability in Andor as well as newly acquired Karian. So that's it, my detailed breakdown of the nation of Andor from the Wheel of Time. Hopefully you like this video and you're liking my Wheel of Time content. Now, I am still a new channel and I am running a current contest if you saw my last video. I am giving away a copy of the Eye of the World from the special edition version from Barnes & Noble. You'll see that up on the screen right now. Here's how you can enter that contest. If you can like and subscribe, like the video, subscribe to the channel, uh, and then leave a comment in the description below whether or not that's a comment about this video or just a comment in general uh, about your thoughts on the series. That'll get you in the contest, and I'm running this up until I get my first 100 subscribers. So make sure that you get in soon. Um, I will ship the book out to you. I'll just message you when uh, we do the contest drawing. But otherwise, please like and subscribe to the video, and click the bell below to get updates about when I post new Wheel of Time videos. Hey, thanks everybody. Thank you. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do My mistress up above, slipping on a robe of blue She prances down the staircase, her fancy us a free Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot?